you're looking at the skull of a seven-year-old child. It's 850,000 years old, found deep in a Spanish cave. But here's what should terrify you. Those scratch marks on the bone? They're from stone knives. The same kind of butchery marks found on deer from the same site. This child wasn't buried. They were eaten. And the hunters who killed them, they were human too. For most of our evolutionary history, the deadliest predator stalking early humans wasn't what you'd expect. Not saber-toothed cats. Not giant bears. Not venomous snakes. It was other humans. And we have the bones to prove it. The year was 1994. The team working at Gran Dolina, in northern Spain's Atapuerca Mountains, had already spent years carefully excavating through layers of time. Level TD6 seemed promising. Animal bones, stone tools, the usual markers of human occupation. Then Aurora Martin Frances lifted a small skull fragment from the dirt. It was unmistakably human. Young too, maybe six or seven years old, based on tooth development. But something was wrong. The bone bore a series of parallel scratches, too regular to be natural, too deliberate to be accidental. More bones emerged. A jaw here, a femur there, ribs, vertebrae, finger bones. By the time they finished, they'd recovered remains from at least 11 individuals. And nearly a third of these bones, 288 fragments in total, showed those same telling marks. Cut marks made by stone tools impact fractures from marrow extraction, the kind of damage pattern any archaeologist would immediately recognize. Except, archaeologists usually see these patterns on mammoth bones, or horses, or deer, not on human children. The initial reaction was skepticism. Surely there had to be another explanation. Maybe these were mortuary practices, ritual defleshing of the dead. Maybe the bones had been mixed up somehow with animal remains. Maybe anything, except what the evidence seemed to be screaming. But the forensic analysis was meticulous. The cut marks weren't random or ceremonial. They clustered exactly where you'd expect if someone was efficiently removing meat from bone. The long bones were cracked open for marrow, just like the deer bones found in the same layer. The skulls showed impact points consistent with accessing the brain, another calorie-rich organ. And then there was the age pattern. Of the 11 individuals, most were children or young adolescents. The oldest was maybe 13. This wasn't a cross-section of a population. This was targeted selection. But Grandolina held another horrifying secret. This wasn't a one-time event. The excavations revealed human bones with cut marks in multiple stratigraphic layers, separated by thousands of years. Generation after generation, the practice continued. Like toolmaking or fire control, hunting and eating other humans had become part of their cultural toolkit. Dr. Yolanda Fernandez Halvo, one of the lead researchers, put it bluntly. They were eating their own kind, and they were eating them just like they ate any other animal. To understand how humans became hunters of humans, we need to meet the species at the center of our story. Not the victims at Grand Olina. They were Homo antecessor an earlier branch of our family tree. But their close descendants, the ones who would perfect the art of hunting both animals and possibly other humans, Homo heidelbergensis. Picture them. These weren't the stoop-shouldered brutes of old museum dioramas. Homo heidelbergensis stood tall, males often reaching five, nine or more. They had robust builds, heavy brow ridges, and wide faces that would mark them as different if you saw them on a subway. But here's the thing that should make you pause. Their brains were as large as ours, sometimes larger. The average Heidelbergensis cranium held about 1,200 cubic centimeters of brain. That's smack in the middle of the modern human range. Whatever was going on in those heads, it wasn't limited by processing power. And they knew how to use those brains. The toolkit of Heidelbergensis represents a massive leap forward from their predecessors. Where Homo erectus made functional but rough tools, Heidelbergensis crafted objects of almost artistic precision. Their Acheulean hand axes weren't just sharp. They were symmetrical, balanced, aesthetically pleasing in a way that goes beyond pure function. But it's the wooden spears from Schoningen that really stop you cold. Found in a German coal mine, these spears date back at least 300,000 years. They're not rough branches with sharpened points. These are engineered weapons. Each one carefully carved from spruce wood, 
balanced like modern javelins with the weight concentrated in the front third for stable flight. The longest measures over 7 feet. When researchers tested replicas, they flew true at distances up to 70 feet. Think about that. These weren't contact weapons. They were projectiles designed to kill at range. To kill things that could kill you back if you got too close. The Shoningen site tells us exactly what they were hunting. The spears were found among the butchered remains of horses. Lots of horses. This wasn't opportunistic scavenging. This was organized, systematic hunting. But horses run fast and kick hard. To bring down multiple horses, you need coordination, planning, communication. You need a hunting party working as a unit. The evidence for their sophistication goes even deeper. At sites across Europe and Africa, we find Heidelbergensis hearths dating back 400,000 years. Not just fire use, controlled fire. At Terra Amata in France, archaeologists uncovered the remains of ancient shelters. Oval huts 8 to 15 meters long with central fire pits. These weren't nomads constantly on the move. They were building homes, maintaining fires, creating persistent places on the landscape. And here's where it gets darker. The same cognitive abilities that let Heidelbergensis coordinate horse hunts, the planning, the group tactics, the advanced weaponry, those work just as well on other targets, even human-shaped ones. Let's go back to those bones in Spain. Because the most disturbing part isn't just that early humans ate each other, it's who they chose to eat. In nature, predators typically target the easiest prey available. Usually that means the old, the sick, the young who've wandered too far from protection. It's energy economics, minimum risk for maximum calorie reward. But the Grand Dolina evidence breaks this pattern in a chilling way. Yes, the victims were young, but they weren't infants or toddlers who would have been genuinely helpless. They were children and young adolescents, mobile, aware, presumably protected by their groups, and they weren't picked off one by one over centuries. The TD6 layer represents a relatively brief period, meaning multiple young humans were killed and consumed in what amounts to a prehistoric blink of an eye. Dr. Marina Mosquera, one of the researchers who spent years analyzing the remains, offered a hypothesis that makes your skin crawl. This could be a strategy if you want to reduce a competing group's future warrior strength, you don't go after the adults who can fight back effectively, you target their children. It's almost too calculated to contemplate, but the evidence supports it. The butchery wasn't desperate or haphazard. It was methodical, efficient. The same stone tools that filleted horses, filleted humans. The same techniques that extracted marrow from deer bones, cracked open young femurs. The processing was thorough. Every scrap of meat was removed. Long bones were systematically broken for marrow. Even the skulls were carefully opened to access brain tissue. This level of complete utilization speaks to expertise. These weren't first-time cannibals fumbling through an unfamiliar process. They knew exactly what they were doing, and it wasn't a one-time event. The Grand Dolina excavations revealed cut-marked human bones in multiple layers, separated by thousands of years. This wasn't a single band of ancient humans crossing some terrible line during a harsh winter. This was a practice, a tradition, something passed down through generations, like tool-making or fire management. The clinical nature of the butchery argues against any ritual or symbolic meaning. There are no special cut patterns, no evidence the human bones were treated differently than animal remains. They were simply meat. Professor Jose Maria Bermudez de Castro, co-director of the Atapuerca Project, summed it up with stark clarity. This was gastronomic cannibalism. They ate their enemies. Here's the uncomfortable truth. If we could write off cannibalism as something only primitive species did, something we evolved beyond, the story would be easier to stomach. But we can't. Fast forward 800,000 years from Grand Owina. Location, Goyet Cave, Belgium. Time, 40,000 years ago. The players, Neanderthals, our sister species, so close to us genetically that we interbred with them. The Goyet Neanderthals tell a story just as disturbing as Grand Dolina. Five individuals, systematically butchered, cut marks on 99 bone fragments, marrow extraction, 
the same professional processing seen on the reindeer bones from the same layer. But the Goyet Neanderthals added a twist that somehow makes it worse. After extracting all the meat and marrow, they didn't discard the human bones. They used them. A femur became a napping tool for making stone blades. Tibias were repurposed as retouchers for maintaining cutting edges. Imagine it, using the leg bone of someone you just consumed to make the tools you'll use to hunt tomorrow. It's a level of practicality, dehumanization. It's hard to even find the right word. And Neanderthals weren't alone. At Covis del Tol in Spain, a Neanderthal child's remains from 52,000 years ago show cut marks from stone tools. The same story, different cave. But surely Homo sapiens, we modern humans with our art and music and complex societies, surely we were above this. Goff's cave in England says otherwise. Dating to just 14,700 years ago, yesterday in evolutionary terms, Goff's cave presents evidence of what archaeologists clinically call nutritional cannibalism among modern humans. The Magdalenian people who lived there didn't just consume human flesh. They turned human skulls into drinking cups. The process was deliberate and skilled. After removing the facial bones, they carefully shaped the cranium into a bowl, removing flakes from the edges to create a smooth rim. They even engraved one of the bones, a human radius, with a zigzag pattern. It's the oldest known engraving on human bone. The craftsmanship is disturbingly good. These skull cups weren't crude, improvised containers. They were carefully manufactured artifacts, shaped with the same attention to detail as their stone tools or carved antler points. Someone spent hours creating these macabre vessels, hours handling human remains not as bodies to be mourned, but as raw materials to be shaped. These weren't desperate people gnawing on bones during a famine. The cave is full of animal remains, horses, deer, ptarmigan. They had options. They chose to eat humans anyway. And they made art from the remains. This brings us to perhaps the most unsettling realization of all. When we first hear about ancient cannibalism, our minds immediately supply excuses. Starvation, desperation, extreme circumstances, forcing extreme choices. It's more comfortable to think of it as survival cannibalism, the kind we can understand, even forgive, like those airplane crash survivors in the Andes. But the archaeological record tells a different story. At Grand Delina, the same layers containing butchered human children also contain abundant remains of horses, deer, and bovids. The climate data from that period shows a relatively mild Mediterranean environment. Plant foods would have been available. This wasn't the depths of an ice age with desperate humans gnawing on anything to survive. The paleo-environmental evidence is particularly damning. Pollen samples from the same period show a landscape of mixed woodland and open grassland, ideal hunting territory. The diversity of animal species in the archaeological layers speaks to a rich ecosystem. These weren't people living on the edge of starvation. They were successful hunters with multiple food options. The Goyet Neanderthals? Their cave shows evidence of successful reindeer hunts. Lots of them. They weren't starving when they processed their own kind with the same methodical approach they used on those reindeer. Even at Gauss Cave, where the climate was admittedly harsher as the last ice age wound down, the inhabitants had access to diverse food sources. The presence of migratory birds suggests seasonal abundance. The careful crafting of skull cups suggests time and energy to spare, not desperate circumstances. Dr. Sylvia Bello, who led the research on the Gauff's cave remains, was explicit. The evidence suggests that the Magdalenians were successfully exploiting their environment. There's no indication that an extreme event triggered this behavior. So, if it wasn't desperation, what was it? The answer might be simpler and more disturbing than we want to admit. For these early humans, other humans were simply part of the available protein landscape. Not preferred prey, perhaps. The risks were higher than hunting horses or gathering plants. But not taboo either. Just an option. The calculated nature of the Grand Delina child targeting suggests something even darker. Strategic cannibalism. 
eliminating future competitors while they were still manageable. It's the kind of cold logic we associate with warfare, not prehistory. But then again, maybe that's our mistake. Maybe warfare, or at least strategic intergroup violence, is older than we thought. Maybe it's older than Homo sapiens itself. The evidence spans 1.45 million years, from that cut-marked tibia in Kenya to those decorated skull cups in Britain. Different species, different continents, different climates, but the same behavior cropping up again and again. Not as an aberration, but as a possibility always lurking in the behavioral repertoire of the genus Homo. So what do we do with this knowledge? How do we reconcile the Heidelbergensis, who taught their children at Melka Contour, those touching footprints of adults and toddlers together at a butchery site, with the ones who may have hunted other human children? How do we process the fact that the same cognitive abilities that let us paint the caves at Lascaux also let us turn human skulls into serving bowls? The easy path is to distance ourselves, to say, that was then, this is now. We're civilized. We have laws and ethics and grocery stores. We've evolved beyond such horrors. But have we? The same species that created the skull cups at Gove's cave went on to create civilization. No new evolution required. No cognitive leap. Just the same brains. The same hands. The same capacity for both creation and destruction that Heidelbergensis had 400,000 years ago. The archaeological record forces us to confront an uncomfortable possibility. That the capacity for seeing other humans as prey isn't a bug in human programming. It's a feature, one that's been there from the beginning, expressed when conditions align in just the wrong way. This isn't about being pessimistic or misanthropic. It's about being honest regarding what the stones and bones actually tell us. For over a million years, Various human species have occasionally hunted and consumed each other, not constantly, not universally, but persistently enough to leave traces across continents and epochs. The miracle, perhaps, isn't that early humans sometimes ate each other. The miracle is that we ever stopped, that somewhere along the line, most human societies developed taboos strong enough to override what was once just another survival strategy. But those taboos are cultural not biological. They're software, not hardware. And software can be overwritten when the conditions are extreme enough. History shows us that again and again. The bones at Grandolina aren't just evidence of ancient atrocity. They're a reminder, a warning maybe, about what humans are capable of when we stop seeing each other as human. The next time you're in a museum, looking at those old displays of human evolution, remember the children of Grandolina. Remember the crafted spears of Schoningen that could bring down horses or humans with equal efficiency. Remember that big brains and sophisticated tools don't automatically equal moral progress. We like to think of human evolution as a ladder climbing toward enlightenment, but it's more of a tangled bush, with branches of brilliance and darkness intertwined from the very beginning. We carry both legacies in our genes, in our cultures, in our choices. The evidence is literally buried in our past, waiting in caves and dig sites around the world. Each discovery adds another piece to a picture we might not want to complete. But understanding where we came from, all of it, not just the parts that make us proud, might be the only way to consciously choose where we're going. After all, those weren't monsters who left cut marks on children's bones 850, thousand years ago. They were humans, just like us, with the same sized brains, and the same capacity for choice. The question isn't whether we've evolved beyond what they were, the question is whether we've learned to choose differently. If this journey into humanity's darkest prehistoric secret left you questioning everything you thought you knew about human nature, don't let it end here. Subscribe to see what other uncomfortable truths are buried in our past. Because sometimes, the most important stories are the ones we'd rather not tell.